Hi, welcome to Monday Morning Podcast. Today I talk to Stuart Dixon of Veriskin Mines. Veriskin Mines is an ASX listed zinc company. We talk about all things zinc in commodities. You may notice that Stuart has a eucalyptus tree in his background, and that's not actually an Australian landscape. It is beautiful Basque country in Northern Spain. I caught up with Stuart straight from the UK. Here he is. Hi, Stuart, how are you? I'm well, Lachlan. Thank you for uh, having me on. Now, I see you've got a picture of the mine in the background there. I was hoping you could tell me a bit, a bit more about the project and I guess how it fits into the overall context of European mining. Yes, that's right. But behind me, you can see um, actually the portal going into the San Jose mine. Um, this is a flagship project. It's the centre of the Navales Udius project, and that's located in the Basque Cantabrian uh, basin in northern Spain. This is a proven mining uh, jurisdiction uh, and, and has multiple zinc, historic zinc mines uh, throughout it, notably the Rio Sin mine, which was owned by, and operated by Asturiana de Zinc, which was uh, acquired by Extrata and then latterly Glencore. That's a world class zinc mine, uh, 62 million tons at 8.7% uh, uh, zinc and 1% lead. Uh, that closed in 2003, and that is super close to us. It's nine kilometers. Uh, so uh, we see um, the Navarra Zudias project as being uh, the twin brother of Rio Sin. And in fact, actually, the locals always used to call it the little brother. But our job is to, to make it of, of equal size, and it's certainly of equal quality. This is all close to uh, the regional capital, Santander, um, which has uh, international airport, has deep water ports, uh, has all the infrastructure you'd expect of a, of a modern European uh, city. And most importantly, I think it also gives us route to markets. Um, we're right at the hub, hub of Europe. Um, we have the Glencore smelter, the San Juan smelter, just around 80 Ks uh, from a lead project. Uh, and that's really important because that's taking feed from Australia, Alaska, uh, all, all around the world, and then uh, smelting, those, um, smelting those ores into, into refined zinc into, into European markets. So having being able to have a local supply, we think will be really interesting for what is happening in European um, mining and uh, the industrial strategies of uh, the EU. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, because I do just want to say a little bit more about the project, um, because we've got some great above ground characteristics, as I've just mentioned, but below ground is also really super. We have a carbonate hosted MVT deposit. Um, MVT deposits um, account for about 25% of global zinc. Um, they're well understood geological systems, and they're typically high grade and found in clusters. And that's exactly what we're seeing um, in Cantabria around the, the Navala Studios project. Um, so we know that the um, from from a period of mining uh, of the, which we've got the data, we know the San Jose mine um, produced at a head grade of around seven percent. We've benchmarked that in our local uh, in our latest presentation, and that makes San Jose come out very favourably on a on a head grade basis. Um, and we're seeing the clusters around it, and that's really one of the limbs of our strategy, which is to um, pull together all these small deposits. Um, we've got 88,000 meters worth of historic drilling, which we've managed to compile. And so whilst that has been extremely um, important, hasn't always been eye catching until we got the drill bit working, but it's enabled us to have a really successful drilling campaign. And I'm sure you're going to ask me about, about that uh, in a minute. Um, so simple mineralogy, straightforward processing from MVT carbonate hosted deposits, which means you typically are at the lower end of the cost curve. And that's super important for economics, as you know. Um, so we've got former San Jose mine is the center of it. Um, that is enabling us to have huge community buy-in because it's a historic mining area. And not only uh, is it a former operating mine, those mining licenses are still valid. And so we've got 18 square kilometers of granted mining licenses around the San Jose uh, mine behind me. So in many ways, it's a brownfield project with greenfield upside um, with all the infrastructure in place, all the mine development done for us. 
We've got nine kilometers of strike uh, over, over the area with another three kilometers parallel strike running to it. So we think above, below ground, we've got all the hallmarks uh, for a really successful project. And that's important in a European context to answer the second limb of your question, because you're seeing the European Union and the, uh, uh, and the countries associated with it really beginning to change their, their, their industrial strategies as they realize that um, they're going to need huge infrastructure spending post COVID uh, to stimulate their economies. There's huge fiscal um, stimulus as well going on. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But also they're seeing that the need to build back in a green way, in a sustainable way. And you've seen the publication of the Green Deal for the European Union. And yep. at the heart of that is also security of supply chains. And so that's been manifested in the EU critical raw materials now for some years. But you're also seeing things like the European Battery Alliance really being formed to focus on where are the clean green metals going to come from so we have an integrated value chain across the European Union to take advantage of not only carbon zero economies, but also EVs, which will play a huge part of that. So we think we're in the right space at the right time, and it's hugely exciting. Well, all of that would explain the rapid rise up the charts for Veriscan mines, um, I guess. And we'll get to the macro questions in just a moment. But what I really want to ask you about, Stuart, is the recent placement you completed and the funds what uh, that have come from that and and then what are those funds will be used for um so you're right um market really has begun to pay attention to to Veriscan, um after the back of frankly some, some some stellar drilling results um which evidence uh, the quality of the of the project which i mentioned uh, just a moment ago so when you're drilling 16.9 meters at 12 and a half percent zinc with two percent lead you know, another 23 meters at 11.5% zinc with another 2% uh, 4% lead. You know, these are world-class intersections by, by any stretch of imagination. You then layer that on the fact that this is in a, an already established mine and it tested a lower lens. So none of that mine has been tested um, aggressively at all for this. So um, I think people have really begun to see all the hallmarks of this pro or the characteristics of this project coming together and go, wow, this is high grade, high quality, all the component parts in place. And frankly, that enabled us to take advantage of um, market demand. Uh, we also had huge demand uh, around the world and in an oversubscribed placement. So we just basically very surgically went out to take advantage of our um, placement capacity uh, and top up the tin and as all explorers, developers need to, to be constantly making sure that they're properly capitalized to conduct their work program. So what are we doing in the work program? Well, frankly, it is reinforcing the success of um, uh, earlier this year, which is you know, follow on drilling. Uh, we expect to be drilling back in the San Jose mine uh, shortly. We're already in well advanced discussions with drill contractors. Um, and we've also had drill contractors out to look at surface targets, which we've already identified in the wider surrounding uh, license areas. So um, capital is going straight into the ground, reinforcing success, keeping that momentum up. Uh, and I'm super excited. And it's the summer up here in Europe as well. So we should have great conditions for it. Well, as well, you should be, Stuart. And my next question is going to pivot uh, a bit more to macro uh, topics. But for people who might not know, could you just give us a broad overview of what Zinc's role is in the world economy? And, and yeah, if you could speak on that, I'd be very grateful. Well, Zinc is one of those essential, versatile and sustainable metals that we need for everyday life. And we probably touch it every day and need it every day without even realizing it. So it's the fourth most used metal globally. Um, it's one of the best performing metals of 2020. It was up some 20%. And um, it is uh, a galvanizing metal, it's often called, and that is for protecting steel. And that accounts for about 50% of usage. And it's critical when you think back to what we just mentioned about infrastructure spending. And we all know that there's huge infrastructure spending coming. We all know a lot of old infrastructure needs reinvesting in as well. So 
A lot of that steel is going to be used uh, in, in of galvanized steel is going to be used in, in that and a post-COVID economy and a rebuild. It's also used in brass. So you make an alloy from zinc and copper in brass, and that touches a lot of other everyday uses that we probably wouldn't even realize, particularly in the medical area um, as well, um, which, which again, as a post-COVID uh, knock-on, we're seeing a, a very positive um, effect there. But we also need it for humans, and um, we take it as a natural element into our into our bodies and actually the UN call it a life-saving commodity. You cannot function without zinc in our bodies. So I look at it as a really interesting metal where we need it for ourselves, we need it for our everyday life, we need it for our environment, and more importantly, we need it for our future. Um, and when you think that our future is gonna be um, a, a low carbon economy, I'm really pleased to say that zinc is gonna be one of those metals which is gonna make a, have a key role in the circular economy. Why? because it's 100% recyclable. So 60% um, of all zinc that has been uh, produced is actually been recycled back into, uh, back into the industrial chain. So it's, it's, it's got extremely strong environmental and ESG credentials uh, and, and it's vital for everyday life. So again, that's why I feel really passionate that it's a, it's a metal for our collective futures. Well, that's very exciting. Stuart, I, I think a lot of people might not know that about zinc, so I'm glad you, you gave us that sort of broad overview of its uses. My next question is more in relation to uh, the macro picture for zinc. You know, people who are metals enthusiasts, they would have seen a number of commodities rising over this period of time on the back of significant stimulus spending. Now, if there's more to come, uh, naturally you'd think the commodity space would continually improve. But I was just wondering what you, your thoughts were on that. I agree. Uh, I think that we've got all the telltale signs of a super cycle and I'm not alone and there's many um, learned experts who are out there calling it again. And I think you're right. We've got multi-year metal prices across uh, most of the, um, of the complex. We've got uh, oil prices rising. We've got increasing global liquidity. You've got policy-driven demand, green and infrastructure capex coming, um, and I think that's really positive for for, for most of for the metals. Um, so where are we today? We're trading near two thousand eight hundred dollars um, per ton of zinc, traded up to over three thousand earlier this month. Um, compare that to two thousand a year ago, so you can see the trajectory uh, that, that that spot zinc's on, and I'm seeing forecasts of at least 10% growth as a as a bear to base case for zinc over the next 12 months. So I, I think that the outlook for, for zinc in particular, but also the wider base metals, uh, industrial metal space looks really strong um, going forward. And we're seeing that also indicated by a number of other things within industry. So I think one of the key data points was looking at treatment charges from smelters, uh, which were published earlier this year. They were $300 per ton uh, for 2020. They're 159 for 2021. So that's a significant reduction. And that tells me that we've got increased smelter demand for, um, for, for zinc ores. And also there may be supply anxiety and I think it's a combination of both, um, particularly when I looked at the uh, S&P forecast for um, mine supply, and they are estimating that current mining operations will be unable to meet smelter demand by 2024. So that needs new projects. And layer that on with the fact that we've got recovering industrial demand, layer on the fact that we've got a super cycle um, upon us. I think all of those lead into those estimates of, of, a, of a 10 to 15% increase in spot prices being actually looking quite conservative. Um, so I think it's great. And putting that, why is that then significant to San Jose and the Navales project or, or our zinc projects more widely is, if I said that we're, you know, we're trading around $2,800 to, to $3,000 per tonne, when Rio Sin closed in 2003, commodity uh, zinc prices were seven, $800 per ton. When Nivala, sorry, uh, San Jose closed in 1997, the zinc price was just over a thousand bucks. So we're three X on 
plus from when these mines closed, and particularly San Jose closed because of the price environment, amongst other reasons. So I think we are really well positioned um, to look at the future for this project in a, in a, in a, in a robust way. Well, I certainly saw those charts in your November investor presentation, and it did paint quite a compelling picture for your project. I might just finish up with a final question here, which is, where do you see uh, Veriskin Mines in two to three years? And what's the ultimate goal for the company, um, especially given all that, that macro picture you just shared with us? Well, I think... What do we want to do is, is continue drilling success, really, to, to, just, to, to, to do the project justice, to look at the scale of this project, to look at the quality of this project. And that really then begins to influence our um, development strategy. And I've always said that there are two um, opportunities presented by this project in particular. One is a restart, mining restart operation, uh, probably smaller scale, ramping up. And um, that's something that, you know, I think every every project developer wants to achieve is taking it from from um, f- from pre production into production. That's a that's a hallmark for anybody, a validation of success for anybody leading a, a junior resources company, and it's something that I'm quite keen to try and achieve. Uh, I know it's something that uh, our local community, host community in northern Spain, wants us to achieve. I know it's something that the politicians and regional president in Spain wants us to reachieve. So it's just how do we get there? Can I get there in two, two to three years? Um, perhaps, um, but I think we've got to keep, we've got to keep looking at, at, at de-risking the project, looking at the size and scale of the project um, and making sure that it's robust and benefits all. So um, we are looking at that. It's something we'll continue to look at, but also the second element to this is looking at the regional resource potential um, as I said, we're surrounded, well, we, well, we have the, the Rio Sin, sorry, the uh, San Jose mine, we sat on a nine kilometre strike with a three kilometre uh, parallel strike. So, you know, we've got a hell of a lot to go at. And I think it would be um, uh, improper for us to rush ahead with a small scale operation when actually we might be benefit from a more hub and spoke operation where we look at multiple deposits feeding in or we look at standalone deposits so you know we're in an oil field it's high quality it's proven and i think we're going to have uh, some really tough decisions to make because of the really positive nature of the project so that's really where i want to be so you can what can people expect they can expect more drilling they can expect more uh, higher resolution of the project in terms of how it all fits together that feeds an overall picture of a resource and then that will fit an overall picture of how we how we begin to um, monetize it, frankly, in a cash flow scenario. Well, I think that's all very important context for people that might not be too familiar with mining. Um, they they do take time these mines, and uh, it'll be an exciting journey for your company, Stuart. Well, well and, I'm and, seeing- and the, yeah, that's it. You know, I, I'm 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 very pleased. For you coming on this this uh, well morning for you you're you're based in the UK at the moment so um, yeah very grateful that uh, that you spent some time with me this uh, this evening for me in Melbourne. It, it's my pleasure and I, I hope that we can have a follow up in, in due course and you know my doors always open for you and other uh, other investors who may have follow up queries so um, I look forward to continuing the dialogue. I appreciate that very much, Stuart. See you for now. Okay. Bye bye. Well, there's a great chat with Stuart Dixon of Risk and Mines. I didn't actually know that zinc was the fourth most used metal in the world. And so I thought his comments in the context of that about zinc and the global commodities boom were particularly interesting. As always, please get in touch, subscribe, like, we'd love to hear from you.